I, I do want to again uh, welcome those who are watching us uh, live stream. Uh, that audience has continued to increase and in worship with us. I want to say good morning to you uh, as well. Uh, we have a guest pianist today, and the doxology is a song that can separate Christians the way that English separates Americans from Europeans. <laughs> right? Yes. Okay. You have to have lived over there to get that joke. Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. We are made to worship. It is part of who we are and how we are designed and what we are made up of. And we will worship something. Something in our life will come up and we will tend to worship it. There is a quote here from um, Ralph Emerson Waldo, is that his name right? Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, yeah. You... <laughs> See, I, I was raised in the 70s and you say Emerson, I'm thinking Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, but that's <laughs> a whole nother thing. A person will worship something, have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will come out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. What we are worshiping, we are becoming. As we've been working through this series on the graces that make us more into the likeness of Christ, spiritual disciplines, one of them is worship. And it is something we do corporately, and as we come together, we worship God, and it forms us into the likeness of Christ. And the way that that is to work is we are ushered into the presence of God. Worship should, if we get it right, bring you into the very presence of the living Almighty God here in our worship space. One of my favorite teachers on worship uh, she, she was written a book called uh, A Holy Waste of Time. <laughs> kind of catchy. A Holy Waste of Time. And as she said, if we really realized what was going on in worship, we would hand out crash helmets and life jackets. If we really realized what was going on, we'd hand out life jackets and, and helmets because we are being ushered into the very presence of God. If we read in Genesis, what is broken in the beginning in the story of Jesus, Genesis is being in the very presence of God. What is being repaired in Revelation, the last chapter, is we stand around the throne of God and we are again in the presence of God. So this time in between, we are being made ready to again be in the presence of God and we are being formed into the likeness of Christ. That is the Christian walk. So that we are again made ready to be in God's presence. Now our scripture reading today from uh, Isaiah is one of my favorites. Where King Uzziah has died. Now if you don't know your history, uh, he was one of the longest reigning kings. He started at the age of 16. He had reigned for 52 years. And it was one of the most prosperous times ever for Israel. They had the greatest economic power. Everybody, uh, there was, it was just a grand time. And then he died. Now, can you imagine having the same person in charge as king for 52 years? Most of the people who were alive at this time had never known another king. And he did a great job economically for Israel. The problem was, he had not done a great spiritual job. If you read the story of what took place, there, there is another prophet who rose up and had called him out and said, you need to quit doing what you're doing. But guess what? All of the advisors and all of the teachers and everybody else said, don't listen to that prophet because we must be blessed because we're doing great. And he said, get ready because the day of the Lord is coming. And in case you don't know what that code language is for, it's get ready, it's going to get ugly. The day of the Lord gets ugly 
for everybody. And so he predicted an earthquake. The earthquake took place. Things got really bad. King Uzziah decided, you know what I'll do? I'll take the offering myself into the Holy of Holies. Guess how that went? Badly. And then he died. And Isaiah and all the people were grieving. They were going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do when everything goes bad? You ever been in that place? Well, you wonder what is going to happen with the rest of my life when everything has come unglued, everything has come undone, and then Isaiah has a vision. He is ushered into the very presence of God, and in the very presence of God, he sees the temple. Now, you've got to just picture the temple. The doors are at least three stories tall, as tall as this building on the inside. Uh, The doors were uh, extremely wide. Uh, Two of them would probably go from the piano to the organ. And the singing was so loud of holy, 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 they shook on their hinge pins and the threshold vibrated and smoke poured out. Now, do y'all get the idea what this picture's like? It's got to be amazing. Amen. You can give me the crash helmet. (laughs) I need a life jacket. It's, uh, look, to be ushered into the presence of God is both terrible and wonderful. It's both terrible and wonderful. Because when we get ushered into the very presence of God, we are confronted with what is not truth. With all the things in our life that are wrong, with all the things we have not done correctly, all of that comes crashing down on us. And at the same time, we are then ushered into mercy. It is terrible and wonderful all at once. And what does Isaiah say when he sees it all? I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And then a seraphim picks up a coal, places it to his mouth, he is cleansed, and then he is then made ready to go into the world. You see, that's what worship is. Worship is we are brought into the presence of God, we are confronted, we are cleansed, and we are made ready to go into the world. That's what worship should do with us. And is it always pleasant? No. But is it good? I mean, you see how excited Isaiah is. So there is this process where we live many times, and and I know you have and I have, when you wonder, is God still seated on His throne? When when things have gone bad, when things have gone wrong in in the world, and, and, and we need to see God on His throne. And worship invites us into that place. So in this series... I've been talking about the things, uh, and, and I have four things this day that we can practice that help us practice the presence of God, that help us practice worship. And, and so I want to invite us into the steps that, that there are. Uh, the first one is practicing the presence of God in our daily life. Did you know, and I'm sure you do, through prayer, through meditation, through study, through many other ways, we can practice the very presence of God in our life every day. And as we do that, it helps form us. But we need to be practiced at not just worship on Sunday morning, but on a daily basis as we go through life. And there was a time that it really came home for me, and it really helped form and develop me, uh, was... When I was a Boy Scout at 14 years old, we went to Philmont, New Mexico, and we hiked about 60 miles uh, in the New Mexico mountains. And if you've never been, it is a gorgeous and wonderful thing to do. And at 14 years old, I was four foot nine and weighed about 80 pounds, and I carried 40. They now have weight requirements. I don't think they'd have let me go now. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) And they shouldn't have. It's okay. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. Now, when I got home, my mom had to buy me all new clothes because you you heard of those growth spurts? I got off the bus and my clothes didn't fit. But but here's what happened on that that trip. 
Now, if, if you haven't been to the mountains in the summer, uh, we went, it was uh, the 4th of July, July weekend, uh, and we were there, and it rains during the monsoon season there. And it rains every day. And about the second day on the trek of hiking out there, now, now they don't really have trading posts. I have to describe this Boy Scout camp. This Boy Scout camp is roughing it. If you don't have it on your back, you don't have it. It's a simple rule. So if you've got it on your back, you've got it with you. Somewhere, somehow, a 14-year-old lost his poncho, which is your rain gear in monsoon season. Yeah, not good. So guess what I spent every day doing while I was hiking? Lord, it'd be really good if it didn't rain till we got to camp. You know, Lord, it'd be really good. Uh, for the entire time that I was hiking, I was in conversation with God about the weather forecast. <laughs> and I would be admiring God's handiwork, and I would be spend time walking along, and I'd watch the clouds, and I'd go, boy, it'd be really good, Lord, if it didn't rain for another hour or two. Now, sometimes it rained anyway. Sometimes I got wet. Uh, there was a particular point in time, though, with not only hiking in the rain, but in the monsoon season, there is also thunder and lightning storms. And so when you are hiking in the mountains near the clouds and there is lightning, they, they don't tell this to the moms, but it's dangerous. Did they mention that part before they sent your kids? No, of course not. They didn't mention it to me either. And so here's the safety advisory they give you. Uh, there were about 10 young men in our track. They said, walk 20 feet apart so if anybody gets hit by lightning, it doesn't hit everybody. <laughs> if I'm lying, I'm dying. You know how hard it is in the middle of a thunderstorm when you're scared to maintain? Being, because what is the natural inclination you have? To gather together. And the whole time you're yelling, stay apart, is it's lightning and hail's coming down. And guess what I'm doing? Practicing the presence of Christ. But it changed me. That daily walking with God, it brings us to a place of understanding God in a new way. And you can practice God in your daily life. Set aside a time, set aside a place, set aside a part of your life. It is helpful when things aren't going well, but it needs to be part of our daily lives. Number two, um, prepare for Sunday morning. Uh, Y'all know we have worship here 52 times a year on Sunday mornings. And... Saturday night, you can prepare Sunday morning before you can come. Uh, there is a time when we gather, and I know we like to sit and visit, but there it is a time also of preparation of your heart and also of thinking of the things that are going on in your life and the things where we might need God to be working. Does anybody here have anything going on in your life right now that you're not real sure which direction that ought to go? How about that? It is a time of preparation of going, you know what, God, here's some things I need to be dealing with. Here's some things that are going on. Could it be that this morning you have something for me? Could it be that there is some place out there that you can deal with me in my life right now? And, and I think we're really good at doing the anticipation game. Uh, in fact, yesterday I had a really big epiphany on anticipation. Uh, Deb and I flew over to Mount Pleasant for just some Mexican food. And they have a, a jalapeno tree. I was looking for my wife to yell out jalapeno tree. She's right there, yeah, and she, she didn't, you didn't help me. It's okay. But there is something about their chips and their hot sauce. Praise God. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you, but really thin corn chips with just the right amount of salt. And then they have that green sauce. This is, you know, with the sour cream and stuff in it. 
Okay. But I get kind of excited about it. Do y'all have a place like a restaurant that y'all get like, like before you get there, you're thinking, I know what I'm ordering. And I'm going to have, and yeah, I already see some people. We don't do that for Sunday morning. Now there's somebody probably out there thinking, well, preach better. <laughs> <laughs> got a point <laughs> the anticipation that God will meet us with what we have needs to be in our life but if, we, if it's not anywhere in our mind we may not connect so we need to practice that being ready developing a dependence on God this is number three developing a dependence on God uh, I think one of the things we do all too often, and, and I did this all the time, is I made decisions out of my ability and out of my power and out of my authority without talking to God about it. And I think all, all the time we have lots of decisions where we need to talk to God about whether this is what I ought to be doing. Uh, whether it's a job I should take, whether it's somebody to get married to, whether it's somebody to date, whether it's... Uh, I don't know that parking spaces are necessarily in that realm. But developing a dependency on God to be able to help us make those decisions and to live into each of these things, and it, not only dependency on that, but I also notice a dependency on uh, how I feel and how I relate to everybody in the world. There, there's a dependency I need of Christ in my life on a daily basis or I find life really hard. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever just made bad decisions? <laughs> have you ever made bad decisions? And, and so in making bad decisions, I've started to try to make a list of how to know when you're making a bad decision. Because sometimes, sometimes we already know, and we just do it anyway. But, but there are bad decisions, and, and one of them I've noticed is when I'm running from something is a running to something. If you're making a decision to run away from something versus running to something, that's, that's always a really pretty good indicator. There was, there was the time in which God had called me into ministry and I was delaying it. I'd like to say I was not doing it, but apparently the answer I, I was delaying, God was on it. And in that process, I took a job that I probably, I shouldn't have taken. Let's go ahead and be really direct about that. I took a job I should not have taken because I was running from a place to keep from having to go to where God was calling me. I felt like Jonah. And guess how it worked out? I learned a lot. That's a euphemistic way for you children to understand it did not go, it did not go well, but I did learn a lot. But here's, here's the thing is, in life... I didn't have the courage to follow where God was calling me, to learn that I needed to learn my dependence in Christ. So is God calling you to something? Is God calling you to a place? Is God calling you to a decision? And in that, we need to develop that dependence that God will carry us through the things that God calls us to. And if you're running from something as opposed to running to God, it is a clear indication that you're not living into the dependence that we should have in Christ. Worship is a place of sacrifice. Worship is a place of sacrifice. Romans uh, 12, this is your reasonable act of worship, dying to yourself. Worship brings us to a place where there are things in our lives that we need to die to, things we need to give up, things we need to have go. And it may be for a season that it goes away and then, and then comes back, but there are things we need to lay upon the altar and allow them to be burned up. And I will say this, the sacrifices that take place this way are pleasing to God. The smell of our flesh burning is pleasing to God because it shows our dependence. And I'll tell you, in my own personal life, one of the struggles that I've had to deal with, and, and you may not deal with this, but I have certain ways that I want to do things, and I think other people should do them that way as well. And I really think that 
Like, y'all should do things the way I want to do them. Where's the amen and the bell? <laughs> Wrong, yeah. You know, so, y'all struggle with this? Like, so, you know, what needs to go in my life is, as one person put it, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And so there are a lot of ways to get things done, and there's a lot of ways to have them go forward. And in my life of following Christ, I've had to learn to let my way go and let other people's ways come forward and watch what Christ can do in it. But in that process, I've had to let go of some things. And worship is a part of letting that go out of your life. While at Kingwood, a man named David, a wonderful guy, a very get-it-done person, he uh, was an entrepreneur who built multiple different car washes. And so he would take and he would buy some land, he would build a car wash, he would get it up and running, he would get the business all up and going, then he would sell the whole business to somebody and then go do it again. So you can imagine what this guy's daily life was. Okay, go find the real estate, get it built, get somebody in charge of it, get, hire people, get the cars washed, and get it sold again. So this guy's life was a checklist, and he was good at it. So we had the opportunity when a hurricane came through, not the most recent one, uh, one further back, and four feet of water went through a parsonage. And the conference came to Kingwood and said, would you guys help them rebuild this parsonage? And so we said, sure, we'll come alongside you. We'll help build it. We'd gone down to visit them. David went with us, and he met the family who was now living in a trailer that was sitting in the driveway, and all their stuff was out in the yard, and there was piles of carpet and piles of sheetrock and piles of stuff. You ever been to where a flood has been? It's an absolute mess. There were fish stuck in their chain-link fence. Just in case you wonder how it smells. Piles of stuff down the street, you know, and they were just coming by with claws, picking it up. And David saw it, and his heart went out, and his conclusion was this, we need to redo this parsonage as fast as we can. We'll hire all these contractors, we'll do this, we'll do that, and it'll all get done. Now, our director of missions, Judy, had another vision. She said, what we need to do is we need to have people go down every weekend and work on the parsonage and rebuild it ourselves. These are two different visions. As we're sitting talking through it, David was very insistent. Have you ever been in a meeting where there are two sides to something and they are not getting along? That was that meeting. And it was getting a little more emotional, a little more emotional. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. And finally, I, I looked at David and I, and I said, because Judy was not making her point very well, and, and David was not following it, and, and finally I said, David, I said, you know, you've been part of a ministry that goes and works on people's houses. Uh, it was Helping Hands Ministry. You go and replace a flapper valve or change a light bulb or he put in like a wheelchair ramp that was two inches tall. It is really easy stuff. But in doing that, David had become very close with a family who needed help, Shelby Owens. And, and Shelby had had a stroke and, and David had grown in his faith because he had gone and done mission work. And, and so I said, David, what was really important about the mission work you did? Was it changing the light bulb or was it being with Shelby? And, and you could see the light come on. And, and so David had to allow part of his flesh to burn up so that he could understand that the mission of ministry is different. And so he said, I understand what you're telling me. And so for the next Six months, we went as people and changed the sheetrock and changed each of the things in that home. And, and the family that lived there said, you know, one of the most healing things they had were seeing people of God every weekend come and be with them. It was the ministry of people being there, not just the repair of their home. It was being with people. Worship is this place. It's this place where we're confronted with God. And in the 
being confronted, God cleanses us and makes us ready to go out into the world. For there's a hurting and broken world out there. My prayer for you and my prayer for me is may we be confronted. May we be confronted and may we be cleansed and may we go out. For there is a world in need of Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.